Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Loris. I love your studio. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, it's uh, been a while since, uh, well, we saw each other a few months ago, I think. Yes, we did. During Christmas, yeah, I believe. Yeah, just, just over that holiday. Yeah. And uh, before that, it had been, I think we uh, met up at the Collide Gallery reopening at the new location. Yeah. When they had the group show for Hark. And uh, I think before that, it had been a couple years. So Yeah. How, how long have you been at Collide? Probably since 2012, 10. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah, that's been my home base for a while, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, more than 10 years. I remember or 10 or something. Uh, seeing your wall first at the old location. Yeah. And I think uh, my first experience at Collide was potentially during your solo show, the oh. future exhibit. Which one? What, was uh, that the one with uh, the sockets or no, not the sockets? I think it was before the sockets. That was before the sockets. Yeah. With the, the big framed uh, watercolor pieces. Yes. I believe. Yes. Yeah. And that was a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, how long it's been since like just being at Collide and as a resident artist over there. It's been a really good experience mm -hmm. for me. I've always felt very supported. Yeah, so, same here. Uh, especially by the other artists. You know, a lot of the turnout is artists and who they bring yeah. to the space. And so if every artist, you know, brings their closest friends, then all those people get more uh, interaction with artists and different ideas and mm -hmm. uh, it just is a great space for the potential of sharing information and being inspired in different ways yeah uh, I feel like that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast is all the artists that I've been meeting are creatives mm -hmm. really uh, just creative people and many different uh, this whole spectrum of creativity and also hearing their stories, yeah. I just I just feel like it's something to uh, sh like share with the uh, the community, and who knows like what community will be listening, and also yeah, the type of creativity that goes on here in San Jose, mm -hmm. which is which is great. Yeah, totally. I think that's really beautiful. I think it's a great you know genuine perspective on why to host a podcast or you know, to share the connections that mm -hmm. you have with other people and to share their stories and to listen. Yeah. Well, um, the reason why I was very happy to jump on this podcast as soon as possible, because my show is up for another two weeks. So I thought, you know, maybe come out and talk about it, uh, dive in a little bit, and there would still be some time if people were to hear yeah they could go and check it out yeah it's over at a uh, collide gallery uh which is um, in downtown san jose um off of first street was it uh, south first street by um jo joe's original yeah. joe's right across the street yeah so the address is 320 south first cool yeah. the title of your show is a uh, gateway by glyph or a reprise of inner realms can you define glyph yeah so glyph is in my understanding is kind of a breakdown from the word hieroglyph yeah. and is a symbol or a code that is sort of meant to be deciphered. And the symbolism of that code uh, can have a, a layer of meanings, sort of like a Chinese character of some sort, uh, where maybe in this context it represents fire, but in this context it represents man or or tree. Um, and so I think that the term glyph uh, is a cue into a symbol with many meanings. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's like uh, very, it sounds like it's very symbolic also. Yeah, I think they, some of the images that I have shared uh, through social media are what I have been calling glyphs. And at my show, you won't see any of the glyphs hmm. <laughs> um, because the glyphs sort of came about once I finally completed all the paintings. Hmm. And they started to sort of jump out to me as sort of this uh, 
okay, let me describe it this way. Say you climb, you know, you go on this hike and you realize you have to go an extra three miles to get to this like alpine lake or mm -hmm. something. And there's all these switchbacks and it starts to get really complicated and uh, it's actually very difficult. Yeah. And you get, eventually you make it to the top or to your destination and you feel so relieved. <laughs> and so you take that photo of like you and this location or that you made it there and you know five or ten years later you look back and that's the that's the photo that ties the memory of your experience of making it there uh, mm. and to me that is sort of what these glyph images are um, so I think I have a first image yeah if you wanted to share that okay and it shows a little glyph of the different so this is Loris's new work from uh, 2020 yeah, and, and the glyphs, the glyphs that she was just talking about, which sounds like a journey. Yeah, a glyph. definitely. In a way, they're like the memoir that you're left with after you've completed the journey in, mm. a, in a sense. And so each of these are just a piece of the paintings that are at the show. Yeah. And they currently only exist in the digital realm. Uh, what so, does that mean? Yeah, they are... <laughs> they are literally cut from the pieces, oh. cut from the paintings, and separated oh, got it. and identified and given sort of their own life. Um, so for those inspired, I would urge you to attempt to line up the glyphs with their original paintings and see which pieces of the puzzle you can sort of intersect with. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, and when I isolated these, you know, glyphs, uh, they just started to take on a whole other life of their own. And they inspired me in so many different ways. I thought, how can I turn these into sculptures? Hmm. How can I turn these into board games? Or, you know, what kind of play and simplicity after all that hard work of making this painting <laughs> and, the and, you know, the challenge of working with the layers. And now I have this simple form. Uh, I quit, you know, was it worth it to, <laughs> to, to do all that work just to have this simple thing? And in huh. a sense, that's the only way I could arrive there. Wait, well, you had that feeling that it wasn't worth it. Or like, you know, do I even need the painting now that I have this glyph here, you yeah. know? Oh. And so just the way that uh, the simple message can, I don't know, just sort of be a, um, a reminder or a memoir and seeing them separated from the paintings is refreshing and then seeing the paintings themselves is another experience wow yeah because you have this like there's this whole piece to these glyphs like like you're saying and it's kind of, it's making me feel like i want to take a journey to collide gallery and <laughs> and i'm going to create my own glyph in that in the sense of my own inner personal experience yeah and then I arrive at your painting and take another visual journey through your pieces mm. and locate a glyph or maybe see a glyph that mm -hmm. in your painting that is uh, responding to me and my uh, my feelings like 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 this one for example uh, I see Azteca in it. Mm. A, a mask. I see an Azteca mask, and it, it makes me feel that way when I look at this. And if I were to see the whole painting, I would have never experienced that. I agree. Yeah. So that that you see a mask in there is also really interesting, uh, because a lot of the paintings and the way that I work comes in layers and transparencies and mm -hmm. are you looking through something or did you already pass through or are is it a doorway or a window and those are the kind of situations that um, the work kind of creates for the viewer and are directly related to my experiences while I'm making them yeah uh, and and I remember 
reading your experiences from um, your, uh, I guess your introduction to your artwork on like the, I think it's the Clyde uh, a website, cool. and sa um, stating that you were going through many um, emotions, like yeah, definitely going, um, creating while creating it. Yeah, and earlier you had asked, you know, uh, what do I mean in that statement when I say, you know, my journey back into creation. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting you bring that up because when I hear that phrase, journey back into creation, yeah. I'm kind of torn between the past and the present and the future because of the way journey uh, and crea creation is like an active thing that is like forming in the moment, mm -hmm. but then a journey is something that leads you forward, but then it's going backwards. And that confusion <laughs> is sort of the sort of uh, overlay of moments that I've been juggling and that mm -hmm. I've also been letting go during the process of painting. So um, I think there was a way that I used to make. Uh, again, let me just say this is the first series of paintings I've completed in seven years. So I did painting wow. a, pretty much solely for about 10 years and then I took a hiatus and did installations and sculptures. And mm. so this is, you know, diving back into painting after quite a break. Got it. So uh, that's quite a long break, seven years from yeah. uh, painting. Um, so, yeah, this journey back into creation, there was this way that I used to make and the feelings and the results mm. of that practice. And then there's this way that I imagine myself to create and put things into the world. Yeah. And then there's this moment and what I'm actually capable of doing in the present and uh, where I'm many times pulled in between. Mm -hmm. And so this is tied to things I've celebrated of the past and that I put at value and things that I wish and dream for in the future. And then that kind of confusion or gray area of being where you are now and how that's difficult to meld those realms. Melding realms. Yeah. That's, that's a, uh, I like that statement. It's very deep. It, it makes me uh, feel like it's hard to explain in words, but the, the creation process and. It really is. And I felt like some of my work, uh, my older paintings that really led me to this point of, of course, mm -hmm. all the things you do kind of lead you into the direction of where you're going. Um, but they have sort of specific stories yeah. and they have a architecture, sacred spaces, things that are my experiences that I've tied to them and my interactions with nature and the world out of my body and wow. merging it with my body. And in contrast, in a way, this new body of work is free of all, a lot of that outside interaction. And I think is really timely with you know, COVID and quarantine yeah. <laughs> in an interesting way because I really drove uh, my intention and authenticity towards creating work that was really my own and from the inner place. Uh, so the symbols and the sort of abstractions mm -hmm. that overtake a lot of the work uh, aren't as laid out as some of mm. these older stories. And in a way, they don't have a specific story to each one. And I really love that about them, too. So pra art practices change. And for about two years after finishing my MFA, um, I kind of felt like a wanderer. Yeah. And I was pulled, which at times is a blessing to be a wanderer. And at times is, can also be difficult. Um, can you further go into detail? What do you mean by a wanderer? Yeah, yeah. well, it didn't. You know, I wasn't quite ready to take painting back up or feel mm. like one art form was my way or that 
I even knew what to say with making art. Mm. Uh, Cause it's as though I remember having enough uh, confidence and power to know what my art was saying and then to transition through a state where maybe I didn't understand that. <laughs> maybe I don't know yeah. what it's for and all I can do is manipulate objects in front of me until I understand what they're doing and how they make me feel. Uh, so kind of like, it seems like reverting to like a primitive practice yeah. where I am engaging directly with sculpture and found objects and uh, it's challenging, but I found myself making like compasses and mm. maps and magic wands and these tools that in a way I was making to sort of guide me through that time of wandering. That's so cool. Uh, do you feel like some of your paintings, like your old or like paintings that you created and as time goes by, they have, they communicate to you differently or take on new meaning? Mm. Like when you see an old piece or, or if something in history happens and like, for example, this one has, uh, this piece right here has an elephant. And like, what happens if uh, something happens in history where right. an elephant, like? Yeah, well, I think an interesting thing about these works is that many of these places I've been, I've documented photographs mm. of these architectures. And as time goes on, those spaces, those architectures, might not be accessible yeah. or, you know, might fall into states of ruin. So I think uh, that in a way they are kind of like timestamps mm -hmm. and they sort of uh, represent that place at that time. And yeah, is would this happen to be in Santa Cruz, this piece right here? This one is. Or in Berkeley. I love, I love that you see that. Where in Santa Cruz or Berkeley do you see this place? Somewhere in the Redwoods. Yeah. And there's like this area that I feel that when I look at it, I feel that area. So it's really interesting you say that because how place can kind of overlay and exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, and some place that I know to be a certain, you know, a certain location can communicate totally different space to another. And that's something really beautiful about the sort of the abstraction yeah, and yeah. The potential of art to create relationships with people on an individual mm -hmm. level. Yeah. Sometimes when people uh, uh, view my paintings, they, they bring out a new part to it that mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, I had no intention of uh, anyone experiencing that, but it brings, it brings that to my awareness and it changes my, my view of the of the painting mm -hmm. and then that's where it takes on new meaning for me so cool uh, i wanted to ask you uh, what what has been your earliest memory uh, of an art experience or creativity yeah um probably building rock dams and bead necklaces at summer camp at <laughs> allen rock park Oh, wow. next to the creek. Did you grow up in uh, San Jose? I did grow up here in San Jose. Cool. And uh, every Friday and Mondays, we would go to Alum Rock in our little groups. And uh, I guess when I think about childhood and art experiences in general, I am reminded of this of summer camp. And every Friday, you know, we would go to this place and our camp leaders would distribute these colored beads. And mm. uh, I have this memory of sort of sitting by the creek and stringing my, you know, my newly earned beads. There were like badges where each color sort of represented a different kind of human characteristic mm. or good quality that I expressed throughout the week. And I wondered if should I string them in the order I received them? or should I create color patterns out mm. of them? But mostly like using my hands to just arrange the colors and shapes and how those colors and shapes have meaning. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, That's cool how you said, like, should I arrange them in the way I received them? Mm. I, I would never think that way, mm -hmm. which is really cool. I, I would go straight to color. Color, right? <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, oh, color. Let me, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really start to identify as an artist until I was much older, maybe 18. Or... So, uh, so, like, how did that reala realization come about? Um, I had, like, been a musician and oh. taking music classes at school and then went to a school that didn't have bands. So then I hopped in the choir and that didn't really work out so well. And <laughs> so then I hopped into an art class. And uh, by that time, I had come home and sort of looked at my room and realized it was just an entire collage already. Yeah. And I had already been doing that process for many years and didn't really have a name for it. So that was kind of interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, my, my mindset, uh, I feel like in high school is when I probably sophomore year when yeah. I was taking art class and I was just enjoying it so much right and just so that's all I, I wish there was art class all the time type of deal so I guess that would be my uh, when I started to identify like I want to be an artist or like be an artist but I already am an artist mm -hmm. in that creative sense so just interesting how we uh, identify yeah, I think there's a lot of beautiful possibilities that come from that identification and mm -hmm. sort of like opening up to uh, new teachers and, you know, new inspirations. And I think it can also lead on a path of confusion at the same time. Most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I feel like a, well, like a lot of my confused mind, mindset as being an artist is that everyone else is like better than me and why why should i become an artist right what what is it that i am like bringing to the table or you know uh i i i think you're not alone in that experience mm -hmm. and part of that challenge as artists is you know if you want to do this with your life are you able to you know withstand that suffering <laughs> yeah it's so interesting like so am i my like I, I know you've done many murals as well and i feel like uh, I, I just wanted to share when i when i was doing murals it was a uh, i feel you on how feeling the all these emotions while painting and it's interesting to like think about seeing a painting and there's many mark makings being uh, seen throughout an art piece and what thoughts were going on through the head and emotions and the type of it's very meditative like you're in like this complete meditative state because you can't leave until you just leave you're just painting for hours mm -hmm. and if only people could see what is going on through an artist's head while creating a piece it would be very interesting <laughs> yeah i think that is sort of the where the play of the canvas comes in play and the, the choice of the artist too like is making the work to say what you're thinking about or is making the work to show what you're feeling and i i think there's ways to curate you know as artists you have a choice mm -hmm. you know do you what are you trying to share with that and Lately, for me, it's been best to not choose and to just do. And in that sense, I kind of fall into the show what I'm feeling. Show uh, what you're feeling. Or in a way, creating it without expecting a response. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, like pure childlike form of uh, creating. Yeah. And I, I think uh, I just got like a little flashback of... Uh, <laughs> of an earlier, I think you just started um, your uh, master's program mm -hmm. or not started, like you were in the the, the, uh, the journey of, of it and you had another show at Collide where uh -huh. you created uh, at the simplest form, uh, prim 
I want to say primary shapes, basic shapes. Mm -hmm. And is, is yeah. that, was that your, I remember t speaking with you about that. Yeah, that was, uh, I think it was maybe a Hark show or it was some kind of group oh, yeah, show, yeah. I think. And I contributed these new works that were very simple. They were sort of musical in mm -hmm. a way. And uh, I don't have them showcased anywhere online, I don't think. But they essentially were like a circle, a square, and a triangle with this like string that yeah. was kind of overlaid through them and little pieces of metal. And uh, <laughs> it's so funny because I put that work out there as like, you know, going into the MFA, trying new things, you know, yeah. wanting to play more, wanting to do sculptural, wanting to sort of get a little bit away from the wall and see what it's like in space. And I remember someone came by and was like, oh, you know, I really, I really like your old stuff better. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, that's yeah. fine. I'm not really making this free for you necessarily, <laughs> which is... I, I feel you on that. A stubborn view, but also you kind of have to know where your boundaries are. Yeah. And, you know, if you are making it for you and then what it means to share it. Yeah, yeah. That makes total sense because I feel like that show that we we're talking about that when you first saw my work, mm -hmm. it felt more like a show for me. Yeah. And because like the number one thing that people would say when they come up to me was, is it a light box? <laughs> <laughs> because I made these frames that were just so fat and big. I just wanted to make frames and that big. I was like, I kind of like it like, yeah. like that just for myself. And uh, yeah, the whole show, it turned like the first phrase that someone would say was, is it a light box? And I was like, oh, also because I had a socket connected to the frame, mm -hmm. but it was just a socket face. Right. Just the face. Yeah. Not a cord coming out to connect to a socket. Huh. So you could see the awareness that uh, we have as human beings at face value when we first see like a piece of art or the the way the mind works. Um, that interested me. Like, yeah, that curiosity to understand something as function, <laughs> I think, is like very much formed by our society, mm -hmm. or to understand, you know, why or have to know what it's for. Um, and then there's that gentler side of things where it just is. Yeah. And that's a that's just an open space. Mm -hmm. uh, so this uh, new body of work that you created uh, uh, was it during the pandemic? And I was wondering, like, if it was or if it was not, like, how has it shaped you or your vision on the world, your uh, the way you create art? Yeah, I mean, so much has happened since I started this work. And I think I started some of these pieces maybe back in October mm -hmm. and I've kind of worked on them. And at first I could only paint for maybe 20 minutes at a time and then I'd get, you know, a little distracted or want to do something <laughs> else. And yeah, then, yeah. you know, as I got into it a little more, I could all of a sudden paint for, you know, six hours at mm -hmm. a time. And so it really felt like I was kind of building a fire mm. of some kind and I was being really careful as to like knowing what kind of wood I was putting in that fire, or what kind of kindling I was going to mm. burn because I wanted it to be mine or just not necessarily mine as in the possessive form, but as in something that comes from my intuition. Yeah. Uh, and it sounds like you're having fun doing it. Yeah, it, it it's been good i haven't that like weariness or that doubt that comes in me like oh what you know what am what am i doing this for yeah <clears throat> i can just leave that at the door um and i've gone through waves of it many mm -hmm. times and uh to have kind of the interesting thing about the pandemic is that it really pushed a lot of people into isolation mm -hmm into that silence place, that sort of stillness and quiet place with themselves that is super uncomfortable at first. Yeah. And then eventually it kind of, you can, it can grow on you. And so I felt like this series of paintings I had started was like a preparation for 
something kind of traumatic like this mm. to happen. Yeah. Uh, and that in a way they brought me stability through that. And that practice uh, is not just a way to escape mm -hmm. this big issue, Yeah. but is a way to just connect more with myself while I'm doing that work. Instead of obsessing about the news or, you know, all of the, you know, human rights and injustices that are constantly happening. Yeah. Uh, to really be present with myself and in that moment when I am able to create. Mm -hmm. And there's so many times where I'm like, oh, like my, this, it's, you know, my work isn't being socially active or I'm not, you know, yeah. helping to change the world by making this, but I am changing myself in the mm -hmm. process of this introspection and taking this time and I think that's one of the best things that you can do to set a foundation to be able to help others is to really set that place for yourself first. I totally agree. Yeah. Like, it's so difficult to really jump into your, your own self and really understand your own inner workings. And the other thing is like, like, do people have time to do that? Right. While we were so busy and now we do have time and, or some people, not everyone, and yeah, it's, that's crazy. But uh, like a, a theme that's been popping up with me and having conversations with people is the, the intention. Like that's been a, a, key, a key word, main word for me, like intention. It's, it's been interesting, like setting your intention, like when creating the, a painting, whereas my, my whole workflow, uh, the intention for most of my pieces when I was doing full-time art was like, man, I need to sell a painting to like right. a monetary transaction right. and which kind of narrowed me down to do artwork and me getting burnt out yeah. with doing artwork just to make ends meet. Yeah. I uh, really relate to that. And, uh, how has your experience been after that awareness came in? My experience, um, so I, I took a, a painting break as yeah. well, or general artwork break for almost uh, since 2017, so almost three years. Mm. But I, I just started a new, uh, some new paintings uh, just recently, uh, last week. That's great. Yeah. Well, before that, it was digital mm -hmm. where I was just doodling. So that was my kindling. Like, I didn't want to bust out the paints yet. I, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't feel comfortable grabbing the old paintbrushes and my already hardening paint in the tubes. And I just went digital first and having fun with digital. And from there, I just busted out the old paints and started doing having fun with it like there was a an artist named uh, caleb Sh uh, Shab from canada he does he calls it trapeze art Whoa. where he has like a like this like rectangle box that he fills with paint um like puts rainbow colors whoa uh, he has his his uh canvas that's spinning and then he he lets the paint go <laughs> And then while it's rotating, the thing's going in, dropping all the paint like a waterfall over the canvas and just splashing like these marble like painted pa uh, painted designs that are just made from nature. Oh, that sounds mesmerizing. Right? Yeah. I could watch it for hours. I like. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just, uh, I, I just t got a tube of paint and just put some iridescent paint in it and tied it to a tripod with rope. And I just like let it go. And it was just like whoosh, whoosh, pendulum. Uh, the, the pendulum uh, stream of paint just and just making these cool patterns. And that sounds really fun. It was so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Without having to think about what to do. Like you just let the universe like movement, the laws of physics just uh, paint for you. But it was from your like intention and yeah. it just creates this like beautiful pattern that's just so natural and so 
uh, beautiful in reflection of of how you view it. That was that's been my experience uh, as of last week. <laughs> Congratulations! That sounds really fun. It's I think it's super important to yes, you know, putting a lot of uh, attention to the work and it giving you what you need to survive is important, but also having the work in its own, like in its own existence and the process of making it fuel and continue to, you know, be cyclical in what you get from it. Mm -hmm. I think that's important to having a sustaining practice. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Change is, is interesting and cycles. You never know how, how long the orbit's going to be between them. So I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing your artwork and Thanks. like throughout the, the many years of and many forms. And I just want to uh, show the viewers some of Loris's sculptures or uh, what would you call it? Uh, it's sort of an interactive an interactive pop up pop up of some kind. And uh, the shop of unsolved ancestry has sort of three about three interaction spaces. Hmm. Um, one where you can pick up a leaf and it'll ask you to ask someone else uh, a question about their heritage or to define the term boundary mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. about their ancestry. And so you would start a conversation with someone and then take the notes and tie the leaf onto the sculpture. The backside has this sort of map of uh, Pangea sort of form with these different landscapes. And the, the question is, mark the landscape. That you call home mm. so thinking of you as a human and the land that you identify with not so much the country or the continent or the ethnicity but you could be from anywhere and still identify with the valley or identify with the forest and mm. to place a pin into those spaces uh, and then the third interaction is audio and you Ooh. can pick up this telephone <laughs> and uh, listen or record Listen to or record a short quote or saying from an elder. From an elder? Uh-huh. In, in someone's family. And so you could mm. pick it up and press a button and it would be a recording, someone telling a story mm. from their grandparent. Um, and wow. then you could record your own. And so after uh, I would sort of observe people interacting, everything kind of had a color code. And you either picked up the red button or you use the blue pin or you tied the yellow ribbon and I would come up and say thank you for interacting with the shop of unsolved ancestry I'd love to give you a gift and I would give them a paper coin and in the coin is a seed and you could take this coin plant it and grow yourself a lemon balm plant or oh. a chamomile plant or a mint and then I would invite, invite them to have some chamomile tea and we would drink the tea of the seed that they could carry with them and plant at home to remember their experience of that's, place. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, wow. It's interesting you show this piece because uh, that, you know, the whole purpose of that experience was to get to the seed. Oh. And in a way, it, not everybody got one, right? Not everybody got to it, but it required that interaction. Oh. And uh, that seed has become sort of the basis and that foundation of that symbol I return to yeah. in this current body of work that's on view now. Wow. And so how the seed is sort of the main glyph of my experience. And uh, it's kind of this overlay of two circles that you're left with this almond, right? And that almond mm. is gray, right? It's not the black side. It's not this white side. It's the intersection of the two and how that space is just so much more forgiving and uh, I, I wanted to give you a little thing. Oh. Mine. Um, here to the almond <laughs> to commemorate the seed. <laughs> uh, oh, and then this is awesome. sort of like a transition of that form that is also visible in some of my new work at wow. Collide. So thank you so for much. For your journey to finding your glyph, there is oh. a key. Thank you, Lars. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that so much. Wow.
Thank, thank you. Like, boom. <laughs> Check that out. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, oh, that's amazing. Haven't posted my new paintings on the internet yet. I'm sort of going to wait for the show to sort of take its place and then move on from there. I did share a few of them, though, um, in the Google Drive, if you're oh, yeah. able to pull those up. Let's, uh, let's pull it up real and quick. We could do a quick preview. All did, right. Did, yeah. Did you want me to um, this is great. scroll through it? Um, and... Sure. Yeah. So this, uh, this is sort of what you might find at the exhibit. And... Ooh, I'm already trying to search for the glyphs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think... Those are so cool. Earlier, uh, you had asked what brings me joy. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, you know, dance and flow states is one thing, mm -hmm. right? course there's all of like the little bits of daily things yeah like you know oh look at the butterfly like, mm -hmm. on the flower sweet right Co coffee for me coffee sweet <laughs> yeah making a really good meal um and in a way most of my paintings and installations are about movement and my spatial awareness and sort of compositions come from how i practice moving through space mm -hmm. So a lot of the forms and intuitions that come out in the paintings are based on that relationship I have and specifically come through dance in a way. Yeah. And uh, another thing on the contrary that brings me joy is stillness. Uh, and I've been tuning into how much sort of relief and clarity that brings joy mm -hmm. that comes from when I get really still yeah. and really quiet and I try to make time for it. Yeah. That's very important. Uh, but I also get a little bit of that time when I get to make the paintings. Mm -hmm. There's like the tediousness of making a painting where you're like, Oh, I have a deadline or I have a, you know, I want to get it, to look like this and then there's the openness of it mm -hmm. where um is really the sort of initial building up of layers for me where yeah. you don't you're not really looking at what you're doing uh, you're just kind of in the presence of color and and form and it sort of like reflects you in that way in that way these are very strong pieces yeah. and thanks very uh i i feel mesmerized looking at them and I could feel the meditation as well and gateways, windows, doors, not even going forward or backward, but up and down. And while you're going through one door into another, there's all these other forms of uh, access and communication and things going on. And yeah, so many layers. Like our, our mind, our body is I guess fully conscious in the way like where we we can't comprehend where people usually say like your your brain can only work 20 percent <laughs> I, I don't believe that that for some reason yeah I feel like you're always at a hundred meaning that you're you know your body's breathing the blood's flowing your heart's pumping if it's not working at a hundred then you're probably gonna be dead but <laughs> right right so this last one here is originally my exhibit was going to be in may and so covid did affect it mm. a little bit and it also um prevented me from completing my series of sculptures which we're going to pair with the piece with the paintings so this exhibit has way more paintings than sculptures <laughs> but um one of the best things that I've kind of come into uh, since entering this wandering phase is welding mm. and uh, sculptural forms. So uh, I look forward to making more of that. And right now they're kind of on like the small scale yeah. um, and then building them up 
to, and that's kind of, that's what really inspired me to keep painting is yeah. find, like kind of just exploring shape with the metal and, and bending it and then realizing that the form I made is actually a form I've painted in mm. the past yeah. and that there's a relationship between how I make the forms in 3D and how I visualize them on the surface of something flat. Um, awesome. Yeah. I love the way you're playing with light here too. The light and the shapes and the way, just like your paintings, like yeah. the many layers, right? Of. Uh, That's a great observation. Yeah. I really appreciate your feedback. This has been a, a really good experience for me. Yeah. I just want to uh, thank you again, Lars, for being here. She's going to be heading to Collide Gallery. Yeah. Right after this. And um, yeah, until you could catch it until uh, August 29th. Yes. Open on Fridays and Saturdays at Collide Gallery from 5 to 9 p.m. Yeah. Um, uh, where, where can people uh, find your work? Yeah. So um, I have a website, which is artbyloris.com. And then my Instagram is Art by Loris. Art by Loris as well. So right there. Yeah. Art by Loris. Perfect. Well, thank you for sharing your art. Yeah, Loris. thank you so much. I really appreciate right. it. And thank you for the, the gift. Yeah, of yeah. course. <laughs> um I, I will probably uh, I'm going to check out your show tonight. Awesome. Um, I would love to see you there. Yeah, I'll I'll be there. Expand this conversation. Yeah, I'm excited to uh search for some glyphs awesome. and maybe find my own. Yeah, and I would love to see and, <laughs> and hear about your experience with that. Cool. Thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks.